came home to the last one of the night. Did you put tea company out of there? No, I didn't. Can you put it down? Thank you so much. Thank you so much. I know that uh, there are probably many faith traditions represented here today, um, and so I want to ask, I want to invite you to a time, a moment of silence, uh, and, and so let us pause, and after, after that I will lift up a prayer. So let us observe a moment of silence as we remember and honor and give thanks to all uh, the Nisei veterans. Gracious God, we gather this morning in honor of our Nisei veterans, both past and present. We gather to remember and celebrate their courage, their strength, their patriotism to our nation amidst the most difficult of times. We give them our gratitude that their willingness to put themselves to the service of our country in harrowing times, times when the Japanese American people, our nation's people, were interned unjustly in the camps that our loyalty might be proven unquestionable. We dedicate this exhibit, Twice Heroes, America's Veterans of World War II and Korean War, here at the Japanese American Museum San Jose, in honor and in memory of all our Nisei veterans everywhere. These represented here today are representative of the many lives and stories that gave honor to our nation and to the Japanese American people. May all who visit this exhibit and see the displays be moved by the stories of our Nisei men and women who served our nation in times of war. And may it forge in us, in each of us, a greater strength of character and hope even amidst crisis and conflict and even social injustice. Bless this exhibit, O oh God as we dedicate it to the lives and stories of our Nisei veterans. Amen. <coughs> Thank you, Reverend King. Um, now I'd like to uh, introduce uh, Tom Graves, uh, a remarkable photographer by profession, but he also happens to be a very skilled interviewer uh, and writer. So he combined all those talents uh, into uh, initially producing a book, which I noticed that David has. Would you put that up so that people can see it? It's called Twice Heroes. And the exhibit that we have uh, is, is kind of a carry-on for that particular uh, activity that Tom started with. Uh, we got, we were lucky enough to get a, uh, a hold of him some, at, in, uh, during his busy schedule and talk to him about would it be possible perhaps for him to add a few uh, photos and in interviews of people in this local area more. And he was happy to do that for us. And so we have veterans sitting here uh, who have been uh, photographed. The photography is amazing to me. Uh, as well as the, you know, the interviews and, and the kind of things that they had to say. Uh, and so we have them here today, and uh, Tom is going to talk to them a little bit uh, after things get going. Uh, but I did want to mention that book, uh, and, and the exhibit that you will see downstairs is simply some of the photos that were taken out of the book, as well as the new ones that Tom was able to uh, put together for us. Uh, with that, I'll introduce Tom Gray. Please welcome Tom Gray. Well, thank you, Joe, and everyone who's here. I'm 
delighted and kind of surprised that we filled the room. Uh, if you're here by mistake, the, 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 the bar is actually in the DFW hall <laughs> nearby. So if, if you feel you're in the wrong spot, don't be embarrassed. We, we get it. Uh, I'm really delighted to be here uh, for reasons I'll tell you. But first, as, as Joe suggested uh, very modestly, um, there's a tremendous amount of work involved in, in putting together a, a, a program like this and putting those photos on the wall. And I don't mean my work, I mean the work of those at the museum. And I have to tell you, they've done an extraordinary job. Um, this, is, this is one of my favorite uh, little museums. I've been here maybe close to 10 times. I always see something new. I always learn something new. And I would expect you to do the same thing. And I hope you can tell your kids and grandkids and friends um, when you see something new or something that interests you or somebody or some place you have in common, uh, please come and see that at the, at the museum. Um, and that's one reason why I'm happy that my photos are downstairs, because if, if that attracts a new audience and people get here for the first time or the first time in quite a while, uh, I'm, I'm really delighted that that might happen. Uh, we're here, and, and my work uh, is always to try to uh, honor the veterans for what they've accomplished and for what they've sacrificed. Um, we're very fortunate to have so many of those uh, in the exhibit here today. I'm really delighted about that. Uh, uh, Joe did um, uh, impress on me his interest in making this a San Jose exhibit. And I was frankly surprised when I went through my list of veterans, I went through the photos in the book, how many veterans there were from San Jose. And, and to them, uh, we've added um, uh, six new veterans, uh, one of whom has passed away uh, since his interview. Uh, four of the uh, five uh, people who are here today, and I'll introduce them to you a little bit later. But, you know, I don't know the size of San Jose, Japantown, or the Japanese American community of Santa Clara Valley in 1940, 1941, I would guess it was pretty small. So for us to have um, these veterans here, just as a representation of their generation and how the young men of that generation participated when their country called on them, in spite of how their country was treating them and their families at the same time, I think is quite extraordinary. And if you know the Nisei generation, like I've gotten to know them a little bit, they're nothing if not modest. And these uh, men up here and many others uh, who I've interviewed and met are no different from that. And that's why uh, some people actually object to the title of my book, Twice Heroes. They say, well, I'm not a hero. You know, I was just a regular guy. Uh, I think Leo here said, uh, you know, I, I did my job, I felt I did my job well. And I was satisfied with that. And I, I think if, if each of us can say that every day that we're working or looking back on the days when we were working, that's a really great statement. You know, I did my job well. They had a very tough job. I was surprised when uh, I received the names of the new veterans I was to interview. Um, Let's see, I want to get this right. Uh, most of them 
were in the 442nd Regimental Combat Team who fought in Europe uh, and who famously became the most decorated unit in U.S. military history. Uh, practically all of them were wounded in combat. Uh, nothing they bragged about in any way during their interviews. It came up almost as a sideline. Uh, another veteran was in the military intelligence service in Japan at the end of World War II. Served there uh, in very important posts. Uh, and these were typical of the <coughs> over a hundred stories that I've heard in talking with uh, veterans, sometimes for two or three or four hours. Um, uh, Fred Kitajima's family is here. Fred was in the military intelligence service. He served in uh, Korea, which had been occupied by Japan for decades until the end of World War II. And uh, he, at times, really put himself in danger as the only American uh, in a crowd of hundreds of uh, protesters, uh, either communists or others, who were, who were uh, rallying to fill the political vacuum that the Japanese had left when they were uh, no longer in charge of Korea as did uh, many of the other uh, military intelligence service veterans who um, are not only modest, but many still stick with the vows of secrecy that they took when they began their service uh, back in the 1940s. And sometimes when someone is not interested in telling their story, they say, you know, I just don't feel comfortable talking about that, I said, well, you know, it's been 70 years. <laughs> I said, yeah, you know, but every day our officer told us you are not to talk about what you've done. You don't tell your families, you don't tell your wives, you don't tell anybody. And after 70 years, they, they keep to that vow that they won't. Those who are willing to talk to me or to uh, others in collecting their histories are doing all of us a great service because they are sharing with us um, their experiences, not as war heroes, but as Americans. And as Americans uh, that I said served under very tough uh, conditions. In each of their interviews, there's 20 uh, uh, veterans whose portraits and stories are downstairs. Each of them will, will tell their own story. And it will tell not only something about their experience in the military, it'll tell something about their families, it'll tell something about growing up in uh, what was a rural area area in the 1930s and 40s, what it was like to be a Japanese American during those times, and what it was like to come home uh, after World War II uh, as a Japanese American, and what they found, how, how Japantown, San Jose, had, had grown so much smaller, for instance. Um, what sort of reception they got from uh, from their neighbors and from new people they met and from uh, landlords and uh, business owners where they were trying to find uh, apartments to rent, trying to find employment. Uh, if those of you who haven't heard some sad and, and really bad stories about those times, um, I can tell you about them uh, from what I've been told. Um, I'm not going to right now because I'd rather stick with uh, uh, with the veterans and and uh, you know those who are here today who can tell us in a few minutes a little something about their experiences. Um, 
let's see. It's, this has been, uh, this project has, uh, has been going on for me since 2001, at first at a, at a very uh, slow pace, and then as the prospect of publishing a book uh, became more real, um, it got up to you know, seven days a week and you know, many hours a day, uh, mostly in the writing part. The photography part is pretty easy for me. I've been doing it for a long time. But the writing is a uh, lonely and uh, very time-consuming uh, process. And, and when I was asked to interview some new veterans for, uh, for this exhibit, I said, you know, I don't know if there's time to do that. You know, I can interview them. That takes a couple hours. But to write it up and so that it makes sense to people, and, and uh, to take somebody's, not necessarily life history, but somebody's story that they shared with me and boil it down to 500 words, which is what you read downstairs. It's not easy to do. You know, um, these, many of these guys literally deserve their own book. Um, so for me to hear their story and boil it down for 500 words for you to, to read and I hope enjoy and learn something, um, it's not easy to do. And I'm very proud of myself, frankly, that I was able to do it um, <coughs> without getting new, stronger uh, eyeglasses. <laughs> um, let's see. So I think I've said what I wanted to say. Uh, I'm, I'm awfully glad you're here today. I, th I think if you uh, read those, some of the stories downstairs and you can read them, you're a pretty good reader in a, two or three minutes each. Um, you'll, you'll see the, the richness uh, and the complexity of the Nisei generation. Uh, my, my photos will introduce you to all these gentlemen but the stories are theirs. I, I just happen to be the one who, uh, who sat and collected them and sometimes uh, coached them a little bit to tell me more. But these are their experiences, these are their stories. Um, they're what they chose to share with me and what I chose to share with you. And there's a, a tremendous history there. I said downstairs to some people, um, I'll be gone, they'll be gone, but uh, their, their histories will live on in places like uh, this museum. And, and uh, you know, your kids, your grandkids, your great-grandkids, decades from now, will have those stories uh, at their disposal. And um, especially if you choose to buy one of my books downstairs. Um, so, I think uh, Joe has a few words to say, and then we're just going to have a, a, a brief and very informal uh, conversation with the veterans. And, and uh, at that time, I and they perhaps can take some of your questions. Okay, so thank you so much for being here today. I just wanted to uh, add a few words about some uh, supplementary exhibits that we have downstairs along with the main exhibit, uh, which is Tom's Twice Heroes. You'll notice that the title was Twice Heroes and More. And we have two other components uh, downstairs that I just wanted to briefly mention to you. Uh, the first one is called The Crusaders, and uh, a Crusaders notebook. Uh, I'm sorry, Crusaders scrapbook. And the Crusaders were a bunch of um, young uh, girls who were in camp who um, decided uh, through the leadership of um, Yuri Kochiyama actually, when she was a young lady, uh, to write letters to the GIs uh, that were overseas or in training or, or overseas in battle. And this became a very uh, popular kind of thing. At first it started out at one of the assembly centers. And because it was so popular and they had such a, a good response, they expanded that and, they, and about four of the different camps uh, started doing the same thing. 
And uh, uh, yeah, um, let's see if I can find her name. Yeah, um, there's a young lady named Ruth uh, Ushizaki who was a very good close friend of, of Yuri's, and she started to uh, compile a note, a scrapbook of all the things that were going on. Uh, Christmas cards that were sent out, letters back from the GIs and so forth. And uh, they called themselves the Crusaders so that, and signed it that way when they sent the things out uh, in order to not get too personal about things. Uh, and you'll see that scrapbook that we had to handle very, very carefully. We took out some of the pages so you could see some of the letters that were sent back and forth. Uh, so I hope you get a chance to, to look at that exhibit. The other one is uh, an exhibit that uh, has uh, six different, uh, what we call Nisei action figures, or they're little, little dolls, like the GI dolls that you've seen, perhaps. In fact, we have that one on the bottom shelf that's commercially available. These dolls were, uh, were, uh, that we have on display uh, were built by, by hand, actually, by uh, someone named uh, Ryan uh, Ibesugawa. And he had been asked several years ago to do a, to write, draw up a, a, a little doll for a um, medic that, that somebody wanted to just kind of honor. And after that he got kind of interested in the whole process. These are not dolls that come in one piece. These are dolls that have, that he, he has to go through a catalog on, on the internet to find heads and hands and arms and uh, helmets and medals and all of those pieces separately. And then he puts that whole thing together and there are six of those downstairs. So I hope you have a chance to, uh, to, to take a look at those uh, as well. And with that, I think we're ready, Tom, if you want to have a conversation sure. with the veterans we have up here, that would be great. <clears throat> What I'd like to do is just introduce um, the veterans who are here today, and um, then maybe the best thing to do is uh, uh, open up uh, to questions and answers, either for me or for the veterans. And if you guys don't have any questions, I'll give you some questions <laughs> to, to ask me. Okay. Um, so let me start in the front. Um, uh, Leo Oyama is uh, in, in, most people are from San Jose. Um, Leo is a retired farmer. Um, he and I got to talk a lot about uh, fruit trees and uh, types of soil and things like that. Uh, he was in the 442nd. Uh, overseas in Europe, uh, as was one of his, uh, one of your brothers, Leo? Mm -hmm. One of your brothers was in 442? One more. One more, and then uh, one was uh, uh, actually injured in, uh, in training and uh, didn't go overseas. Uh, next to him in the hat is uh, John Sakamoto. He came here today from uh, Sacramento. He was with the 442nd overseas, and uh, he was in the regimental band. And that sounds like a lot of fun. And John was actually a great musician, he was in a number of, uh, uh, I don't want to say big bands, but um, was in a number of bands uh, after the war. And um, one thing that he told me that that strikes me, you know, why does a regiment have a band? Uh, these guys in combat, and there's tubas and what have you. Um, after the Battle of the Lost Battalion, where the 442nd had so many casualties, and they came out on the parade ground, uh, 
for it to be to be recognized uh, not for their casualties actually, but for their accomplishments in rescuing the lost battalion. And they played the names of they they uh, read the names of those who were killed in that battle while the regimental band was playing, standing in the snow. And uh, John said we played for a long time because there were a lot of names to read. Uh, next to him is uh, Terry Teragawa, uh, who was a veteran of the Korean War. And even though he was not trained as a linguist, like the military intelligence service uh, soldiers were, uh, his Japanese was good enough to communicate with the Koreans, who, as I said, had been occupied by Japan and who many Koreans uh, spoke Japanese. So Terry became um, so valuable to his unit when his uh, year of duty in Korea was up, uh, his commanding officer wouldn't let him go home and uh, kept him there until uh, there was a suitable replacement with Japanese language skills. So Terry had his, uh, uh, had his view of Korea for longer than uh, most people. Uh, right here on the end, he's not a lumberjack. Uh, Lawson Sakai was in the uh, E Company, the 442nd. And uh, Lawson is the person, actually, uh, why I'm here today. Because I met him uh, in 2001. He was the first person to tell me his story and said that uh, he felt a number of his buddies would be willing to talk with me. And as I heard each of their stories in succession, I, my head was ready to explode. Not only what they did in combat, but what they overcame and what their families overcame uh, at the same time back in the United States. Uh, Sam Sakamoto was in uh, the 442nd as well. Uh, I know Sam, but I've never interviewed him. Uh, he was in I Company. Uh, I Company is famous uh, in the 442nd as uh, taking the highest number of casualties uh, in the Battle of the Lost for the Lost Battalion. Are people familiar with the Lost Battalion? Okay, most people are. In, in brief, an army unit was cut off and surrounded by the Germans. No one was able to reach them. Uh, they sent in the 442nd, and, and these guys fought uh, four days and four nights under very terrible conditions, finally broke through and rescued uh, about 211 other soldiers. But they took a tremendous number of casualties in doing that. Um, I, I Company was one of the lead uh, companies, and, and they took the highest uh, number of casualties. Was, was K Company also? K Company was there with them. We have two veterans here from K Company, and they took uh, tremendous casualties. A, a, a rifle company is rounding things off about 200 people, uh, commanded by a uh, captain. I Company, uh, at the end of the battle, was commanded by a sergeant, and there were eight riflemen uh, in a, still in, able to fight. Eight out of 200, to give you an idea of what these guys went through. Uh, Buster Ichikawa, in a blue sweater, uh, was in K Company. Um, he, was, uh, he was wounded. Uh, What else can I say about Buster? He takes a very good picture. <laughs> he really does. Um, I, in fact, I've got a message on my answering machine at home from Land's End who wants, to, wants his name. <laughs> um, Buster, a very nice, unassuming man. The, 
one of the main things that that fascinated me in meeting uh, these many soldiers is they've all had such incredible experiences, not just in the Army, but for now, for many of them, 90 years and more. And um, you don't know this. You know, you pass them on the street, in the, in the grocery store, in the post office, and oh, here's this you know, nice guy. Um, but man, you sit down and talk with them for an hour. And uh, it's incredible. It's an incredible experience. Um, on the end, last but not least, uh, Katz Hakido, also in uh, the 442nd in Europe, also was um, wounded in combat. Um, Katz, uh, you are, are a mechanical engineer. Is it? You're a mechanical engineer? Am I what? A mechanical engineer? Is that mechanical? Yeah, right. Yeah. Um, Katz came back. Uh, the GI Bill was able to go to college, um, was able to go to graduate school, was able to get his PhD in uh, mechanical engineering, had a full career, retired for about 15 minutes and decided he wanted to go back to work and went back to work and had a second full career. And um, he has a beautiful Japanese-style garden full of fruit trees that I'm invited to go to anytime I want. <laughs> Get those stuff off the trees. So those are our veterans here today. Um, Lawson is from Morgan Hill. Uh, Sam is from so Soquel. Uh, John with the cap on is from Sacramento. Everybody else is one of your neighbors here. So, do you have any questions for me or for uh, one or all of the veterans? And I'll uh, I'll try to moderate. We're just going to do this for a few minutes, so don't be shy because you'll get left out. <laughs> David, please. John said he was a, a stretcher bearer also when he was played in the band, right? Right. And so he uh, he carried the wounded back or the dead back, and then he took food, water, and supplies up to the battle, right? Yeah, David was pointing out that um, uh, John, who was not supposed to be a frontline uh, uh, rifleman, was in the same amount of danger as those at the front line. Because people who held other positions in the headquarters country uh, company, someone who might be a clerk and type a company reports all day, uh, the cooks, uh, people in the band, sometimes in uh, other combat um, positions that weren't able to operate in the very steep mountains in France and Italy where these guys fought. They were put into a service as, as uh, litter bearers to bring the wounded off the battlefield and, and back uh, for medical care. Um, and that's, first of all, it's physically exhausting work. It's not like, you know, walking across the street to the church. Uh, up and down the mountains under um, enemy fire. So, uh, and, and, you know, you're, car you're carrying a soldier on a litter. There's no fighting back. You know, you, you carry him and you try to get to where you're going and back. Um, sometimes when things got tough, they handed, uh, you know, just like in the movies, they handed rifles to the cooks and and uh, everybody in the back, and they said, you know, get up front and do the best you can. <coughs> so, um, uh, one of the cooks in Lawson's company, in E Company, said uh, it, the army regulation is we have to try to give the men one hot meal a day no matter where they are no matter what the conditions are so he had a, a, a camp, a camp a kitchen he would cook their meals he would brew the big urns full of coffee he'd have to wait until nighttime and they load everything into a jeep they drive as far 
as close to the men as they could. And then they'd get out and a couple guys would get a handle on each of these big urns or each of these big, uh, you know, pots of food. They carry it up very quietly to where the, the combat soldiers were. And uh, squad by squad or a few men at a time would come back, eat their dinners very quietly and go back and four or five more guys would come and eat their dinners, you know. But he said any sound of uh, any rattling of the spoons, the lids, liquid sloshing in the, the urns, the Germans could hear that and they called in artillery on them. You know? So there's um, not any really safe jobs over there. But that's a that's a good point, uh, David. Yes, please. Um, can you describe some what what kind of life was like for you, um, someone just um, when you came back from war? Does anybody want to talk about that? Coming home, what you found? What kind of discrimination you experienced? Uh, did you experience discrimination? What was different with Japantown or? Sure. Okay. <coughs> I don't think I can, oh, okay. Oh, okay. Uh, first, let me thank you for uh, coming out to hear our story because I appreciate your uh, interest in our experience. So, so let me say that, you know, I believe that most Nisei who had the privilege to serve during World War II appreciated the opportunity because it was the best way to overcome the effects of racial prejudice to which we had been subjected before the war. Uh, because before the war, you know, uh, 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 we were subjected to a great deal of uh, prejudice. You know, we could use public swimming pools. Uh, Issei and Nisei would get, uh, go to universities and colleges, get degrees in engineering or other technical fields. And when they graduated, uh, they could not get jobs in the chosen field because nobody would hire them because they were Japanese. And, uh, uh, you know, we, we, we could use public swimming, swimming pools, we couldn't buy homes in certain areas, and uh, things like that. And, uh, you know, uh, young old Kim, who was one of two Korean-Americans who served with the 442nd, uh, grew up as a teenager in the Los Angeles area. And uh, 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 Kim uh, was uh, chosen for officer candidate school, and when he got his commission, he was assigned by the state to the 442nd. And when the mistake was discovered, uh, he was asked whether he would like to transfer to another outfit. But Kim said no. He wanted to stay with an Asian American outfit because he says Asian Americans must serve in combat and do it well if we are to have any chance of improving our conditions in America after the war. And uh, Colonel Walter Scamoro, who served with MIS had similar sentiments when he said that uh, Nisei must realize that when the country is at war, uh, uh, the time we should serve a country without conditions or reservations. And he says, when the victory is won, the war is over, that is the time to fight for our rights. And uh, uh, how we succeed in that fight will depend on how well we serve the country during this time of need. And so, uh, so that so that was the fact that uh, you know our experience, I believe, in my own experience, to uh, help us to uh, after the war, because uh, as a sign of that, you know, when uh, July 1946, the 442nd returned home from Europe to America, and they marched up Constitution Avenue to the White House where President Harry Truman presented the outfit with a seventh uh, unit citation. And as he pinned the uh, ribbons of the citation on the regiment's colors, the president said, he says, uh, you are congratulated for what you have done. He says, you have fought the enemy overseas, you have fought prejudice here at home, and you have won. And he says, keep up the fight, and we continue to make this great country stand for what the Constitution says it stands for, for all of the people, all of the time. And so we felt we were vindicated. So thank you. I, I 
said uh, uh, downstairs a few minutes ago, uh, Monday is Martin Luther King Day. But the, the Nisei, uh, with Truman's encouragement, had their own civil rights fight. And they had many, many victories. They were, um, they were instrumental in the integration of the military, which happened in 1948. Uh, they were instrumental in uh, allowing, getting the law changed to allow the Issei to become citizens. In Hawaii, they were instrumental in, they established their own <coughs> bank because other banks would not lend to the Japanese Americans. They uh, were responsible in a great part for Hawaii becoming um, a state. And since then they have, uh, starting with uh, Daniel Inoue, who is on the cover of my book and who's in the exhibit downstairs, um, they've sent a succession of uh, Asian American and Japanese American legislators to Washington. Um, Senator Inouye served for a, a long time in powerful positions. He made a tremendous uh, impact on the people of Hawaii as well as on the rest of us. So um, uh, we, sh we should not forget uh, that the Nisei soldiers and others you know, took up and, and continued fighting, I think, very quietly uh, for civil rights long after uh, World War II ended. Two, two things I want to say before I, before I forget. Terry is sitting here very quietly on the end. Uh, five years after the end of World War II was the beginning of the war in Korea. Five years is not a very long time. Many of uh, the Nisei generation came from large families. They have four or five, six boys or more. And it's very common for a couple of the older boys to have served during World War II and one or two of the younger ones to have served uh, in the Korean War. Uh, the, in the Korean War, the, 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 there were no uh, integrated units. Uh, Japanese Americans during World War II uh, served by themselves in, in uh, segregated units, as did African Americans during World War II. By five years later, by the time of Korea, uh, the armed forces were integrated. But the Japanese American showing up in Korea carried with him the, the legacy of the 442nd. And I've been told that, um, you know, they, they expected us to go for broke um, just because our, because our older brothers were going for broke. Some, some people I've talked to, uh, the younger brothers, didn't want to be left out. They said, you know, my four older brothers were in uh, the service. I didn't want to be the only kid in the family who, who didn't uh, 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 serve in the army, so they didn't list uh, for the Korean War. Uh, some, some of these guys, not these guys, some veterans came home from Europe and uh, stayed in the Army Reserve in order to make a few bucks, and um, it's a pretty good deal until the country goes to war, and then you're back in the Army. And instead of uh, two weekends a month and two weeks in the summer, uh, suddenly you're in Korea. Becky and I spent about 36 hours in Korea in January a few years ago. First day was not bad. It was cold, but no particular big deal. The second day was brutal. Absolutely brutally cold with a wind that didn't stop. We went, we went out to see a museum. It was about three or four blocks away. We got there, we looked around. We were too cold to walk home. We had to take a taxi like three blocks. The taxi driver thought we were nuts. <laughs> we, we no sooner got in the car and two, two, 
two red lights and we got out, but we, we, it, we couldn't stand it. It was terrible. And, and uh, Terry was there for over a year. You know, in, in very tough conditions. It's called the Forgotten War, and, and it was, even while it was going on. People didn't know where Korea was. People didn't know why we were there. Soldiers would go overseas and serve for a year and come home and run into a buddy on the street. They'd say, hey, where you been? I haven't seen you in a while. Well, been in Korea for a year. Um, the other thing I wanted to say was, um, for the veterans who are in the audience who, who I haven't met yet, um, I have my own copy of the Twice Heroes book, and I ask all the uh, veterans to sign it for me. So please um, don't leave here without signing my book for me, okay? You don't have to be in the 442, you don't have to be in World War II. Anyone who's here who's a veteran, okay, I'd like you to sign it. Okay, yes sir. Did any of the gentlemen oh. here walk to, on that Constitution way? After the, when they came back after Was anyone here in, in the uh, parade in Washington? A couple of them, Leo and uh, Buster. Yeah. So, Did you have a hand in the back earlier? Y yes, the lady in the back, please. Uh, what the cats was talking about, the 447 Battalion Courage, uh, filtered down to subsequent generations as well. Sansei benefited and so on. But my question to all the vets is uh, prior to entering the war front in the camps, did your parents look the same way as you did? Did they encourage you or just try to dissuade you from being drafted? Uh, I'll ask the veterans, but I'll tell you the story. Everybody was different. You know, just like every, every young man didn't rush to volunteer when they were allowed to, um, some parents encouraged people and encouraged their kids. Some parents were, you know, were not encouraging. As were brothers, sisters, it was really a very divisive time uh, for families and for neighbors. I know this lady wants to say something. I want to ask them, yes. I was in camp during that time. And, you know, when, when the, the boys volunteer, there were very mixed feelings. There are some of us, and those were mostly the Niseis, they were so happy that, that our boys wanted to go uh, in, in, uh, fight for us. On the other hand, our parents, many of our parents were very unhappy that our boys were going to. So it took a lot of courage for these boys to do what they did. And it's because of what they did that after the war, we as Japanese Americans could lift our heads up and go on with our lives in, and be proud of, of ourselves. And so I really do appreciate so much what all the boys, 442nd of course is, you know, is uppermost, but they, they helped our people so much and I just wanted to see that. Do any, do any of the veterans want to say anything about uh, 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 about the, the atmosphere when you're going into the service? Or your family's encouraging you or discouraging you? Or, well, no, no, no particular thoughts on that. Well, my dad told me, you go in this country, you go serve in this country. Uh, yeah. Sam said his father told him, you were born in this country, uh, go serve for this country. Uh, I've heard that before a few times. Terry, do you have something to say? Sorry, I'm 
part of you and the post is done. <laughs> when, I was, when I was drafted, in fact, I was born in Japan. I'm an Issei. And when I was drafted, I was kind of surprised that they drafted me. But uh, I went to basic training in uh, Fort Wayne, Kansas. And after basic, we took an IQ test over there or something. And I was supposed to go to OCS. But the government at the last minute said I cannot go because I'm a Japanese. Mm -hmm. And uh, I could understand why. If they could, could enough to send me overseas to be shot, why can't I become an officer in the United States Army? But I never got the answer. They said no, no agents could be an officer in the United States Army. So I said, well, that's fine. So when I got to Korea, they gave me a job as an officer. <laughs> uh, so they said, Terry says, um, I understand you could speak Japanese. And all the soldiers out there could speak Japanese, or Korean soldiers. So they said, you're in charge of the Korean company. So I was in charge of a company of Korean soldiers. And they gave me a job of taking care of 250 Korean laborers. And and I also had to go on the front line too. So it's a, it's a, it's a hell of a war. I don't know. I just I got carried away here. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah, it's important. Yeah, I just didn't feel right. But you know, over there, you don't realize how bad those people had it over there. Because when I went to Seoul over there, Walking down the street, I find little kids, my father, six years old, crying out there. And I would ask him, what happened to their father and mother? They said, they don't have it. They were killed. And the North Korean was retreating. They killed a whole bunch of citizen people. And they left the kids there to the starve. Mm -hmm. And uh, mm -hmm. was, you know, I said to myself, boy, if my kids complain about Small thing, I want to tell my father. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Mr. Manny, Terry's talking about the how impoverished uh, Korea was, they, what they found when they got there. And um, some of the places in France, and especially in Italy, uh, you know, Italy had been at war for years, then they quit fighting, but the Germans stayed. And the Germans uh, basically took all the food uh, away from the Italians. So the Italian, uh, Italian people were starving. The kids were starving. And um, uh, the, the GIs, to the extent that they could, uh, you know, help them with food and uh, things like that. But of course, you know, couldn't feed an entire population. So um, Terry said, his kids and others, we complain about little things, but when you see some of the things that these guys have seen, uh, you maybe complain a little bit less. Okay, this gentleman, I've missed you like three times now. Well, actually, it was a question for Terry, and I think he answered it when he talked about his experience. Okay. Um, but I did have a question for Lawson as well, in terms of you guys meeting and, and so maybe start. It sounds like you guys sort of started this project. I wonder if you can talk about, well, Lawson wondered what the, the importance of this whole project was maybe for you, and or if you could talk about a little bit about that. Okay. Did you hear? I told him, you know, we met, you got me started on this whole project. He wants to hear about that from your perspective. Why did you bother spending time with this Hapajin guy? <laughs> <laughs> well, he's a lot bigger than I am. <laughs> We had um, an organization called Friends and Family of Nisei Veterans, FFNV. And it's a, it's a follow-up from World War II. The 442nd used to have annual, a five-year anniversary reunions in Hawaii. Well, most of the companies all over would have their individual reunions. Then 
John and I were an e-company, we would have two to three hundred people just from e-company alone. And we would have reunions all up and down the coast in Hawaii. We even took it to Denver once we went to Washington. When they opened the Smithsonian, we had a reunion there. I had about 200 people in a beautiful setting in Washington. So as we would get together annually, our numbers would get smaller. We would have to consolidate companies together so that we would have enough people to hold the reunion. Well, during all this time, you need speakers. You need a program. And we would have two banquets at our reunions, and we're always looking for another source. Well, somebody introduced us to Tom, and Tom was interested. And it's a story that hardly anyone was interested in because the war was over, and the Japanese-American story was not popular. <laughs> So Tom took this interest in the World War II veterans, and everything went from there. He spent a lot of his time traveling the country and researching, talking to the veterans and finding out more and more. And of course, the culmination of all this is his beautiful book. And I hope you get a chance to look at it or even purchase one downstairs. But that's Tom has been a big supporter of all of our veteran activities. And we're, as part of Friends and Family of Nisei Veterans Organization, we're very happy to have him as one of our prime members. <laughs> so I hope that answers your question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Boston. Boy, that was nice. <laughs> Lawson missed the opportunity to tell you that FFNV has probably the other nicest small museum in the Bay Area. And it's on the USS Hornet aircraft carrier, which is docked in uh, Alameda. Oh. Um, Lawson and uh, Brian Shirayama, who is here today, uh, not single-handedly, double-handedly uh, created this museum, uh, were invited to put it on the Hornet aircraft carrier, and have filled it with uh, films, artifacts, um, documents, and lots of uh, uh, informational uh, panels and opportunities to really uh, learn in depth things that we're simply just touching on today. So, first of all, if you've never been on an aircraft carrier, you really should go. It's, it's very cool. And the Hornet is a very historic aircraft carrier. They have, um, it served, I think, in three wars. They have on it one of the um, space capsules from the astronauts parachuted uh, and landed in the ocean. The Hornet crew uh, picked them up. Uh, one of the significant um, uh, you know, space uh, missions. So that's there. That's very cool to see. Tom, where yes. is the Hornet? I don't know the, the Hornet's in uh, Alameda, California. Um, it's, a, it's a little tough to find the first time, but everybody has the internet now and, you know, it'll take you right to the door. When, when, the, when the astronauts came back from the moon, that's where they were. Everybody, you know, what if they bring back some terrible disease or something? <laughs> so they, they put them in a um, state-of-the-art uh, quarantine uh, container for um, like 30 days. You know, they've, they've not only been in this little capsule for 30 days, now they're in this little bit bigger capsule for 30 days. So you know what the uh, quarantine uh, facility was? Uh, an Airstream. <laughs> <laughs> and 
and so the Airstream is there on the Hornet too. So you can check that out. Yes, ma'am, in the back again. Two questions. Is that a 47 exhibit on the Hornet? Is it what? Permanent. permanent. Uh, it's as permanent as it can be, yes. Okay, and yeah. then uh, what interested you on the, about the veterans? What interested me about the veterans story? That's a good question. That's one of the questions I was going to give you, if nobody <laughs> um, I'm a pretty smart guy. I went to college. I've always had an interest in history. I didn't know anything about the internment. Never heard of it because I grew up outside of California. And when I began to learn about it, I recognized the importance of that part of our nation's history. And even though it was a really bad part of our nation's history, I feel that it's a part that needs to be taught in schools more and uh, talked about more. I gave a talk one year ago at uh, Rice University in Houston and to a group about this size, and they were mostly all students. Uh, I asked them before I began how many people have heard about the internment of Japanese Americans during World War II. Two people put up their hands out of 70 people. And one of them was one of the professors. So that gives you an idea about how little this story is known outside the Japanese American community and outside the west coast of the United States. And one guy in the front row, I, was, I started talking, I had to kind of start at the beginning. I couldn't start with the veterans. I had to start before the internment. This one guy is fidgeting in his seat, hadn't gotten to questions and answers yet, and he just blurted out, how come we never heard about this? I said, well, our country's not very proud talking about it. No. So I, I actually have failed in my mission because my mission for myself was to tell this story outside of California. And so far, I really haven't been able to do that. You know, I'm going to Seattle in about 10 days, but I'm talking mostly to a Japanese American community in Seattle. I don't need to talk to you guys. I need to talk to <coughs> college kids in New Jersey, you know, high school kids in Georgia. Um, I'd like my book to be in high school and public libraries all over the United States. You know, I, I did a little research. There's about 26,000 uh, public high schools in the United States. If anybody wants to become a sponsor for a big project, I talk to me. Um, afterwards. But what you can do is buy a copy for your library, buy a copy for your college library, buy a copy for your kids' high school libraries. You know, because then it's not one book in your family, maybe 10 people get to see it, but it'll be there, maybe a couple hundred kids get to see it. Yes, please. So, what was your profession when you first started? to have the idea of even doing this project, and how were you able to spend so much time on it? Were you working at the time? That's a great question, number two. <laughs> um, I'm a professional photographer. I, I have been um, officially ever since college, although I was before then. And um, this, when I met Lawson and I got interested in the veterans, at first it was a little photography project for me, just for fun. Do something a little bit different from my professional work and hopefully, you know, let loose some creative uh, neurons that hadn't been functioning. And um, then it, it sort of took over my life. You know, I, as I said, I realized what an important story this was. It is, and um, how I paid for it was, at first, you always have a little extra money in your business for, you know, uh, new projects, or ideas, portfolios, exhibits, like the one downstairs. And so at first, I used that portion of my profits for this project. 
Then this project was taking more of my time and there were fewer of my profits. So then I started putting a little bit more in there. Suddenly, uh, it was taking all of my time. I didn't have a photography business anymore. So I didn't have a photography income anymore. So then I started putting uh, my own and, and Becky's own money into it. And that's the phase where we've been in for about 10 years now. So, I had a job. Yeah, Becky. <laughs> and had a job. And, um, but you know the thing, people say, you know, you've got the book. You know, why, do you, why do you keep uh, interviewing these guys? Certainly you have enough interviews. Well, I can't really stop. You know, I enjoyed so much interviewing the new people for this exhibit and learning so much. I mean, how, how can I really stop and, and lose some of these stories, you know? So the, th the thing is, if, if it got to the point we were living in our car, I would probably have to stop. Um, but it hasn't gotten to that point yet, you know? Um, but you know the scary part, and then we'll talk about something else. The scary part was when we decided to do um, the book, because um, I talked to a number of big Japanese American organizations who I won't name, and they all said uh, no for one reason or another. Not you know. They all said no. So. And uh, for several years, I've been talking to uh, commercial publishers in San Francisco and New York, and they had all said no. And I was kind of ready to, you know, hang it up. You know, I, we had done a number of exhibits, like the one downstairs, and I thought, look, the commercial publishers don't think this book will sell. And the, the Japanese American community, you know, their biggest organizations, don't think it would sell. So who am I to have the ego to think that my stuff will sell when the experts, being you guys, say that it won't? And Becky and a couple of really <coughs> close friends said, look, you've put like 12 years of your life into this. Publish the book, even if you don't sell one. You know, publish it for, for Tom. And I said, gee, you know, that's not the kind of thing that Tom does. But they kind of talked me into it. And so um, uh, we published it ourselves. And uh, it's a big deal. And it's a lot of money. And um, thought, well, you know, if we lose money, we lose money. And the indicators were that we would. And it turned out... Uh, we, we were able to do it cleverly and carefully, and uh, we sold enough books that in the first year that it was out, that it paid for the, the printing and the everything. So we were no longer losing money. So, you know, that, that made me feel good, because this is my passion. It's kind of become Becky's passion. But she, you know, has really put up with a lot since, like a lot, since, a lot. Yeah, since 2001, you know. So um, I, I'd like to think I would be as generous uh, for her passions. Um, so far I haven't had that, that trial, that test, you know. Um, okay, one more. Yes, sir. Or, sorry, David, the guy behind you. Yeah, my questions are for Terry. I actually have a lot of questions, but I'll just kind of make it to like two or three. Okay. I, I was really interested by um, Tom's comments about, you know, how he, you were like speaking Japanese. I know it's a sad fact that Japan's occupying, you know, various countries that <coughs> they can speak Japanese. But I was just wondering, I thought, man, the army must be really desperate to have to get it, like a Japanese speaking person. But now I understand you're an officer, so I understand that. But because of that history with Korea, did you feel like the Korean guys under you, was there tension between the Japanese officer and the Koreans? And were there a lot of Korean people that, Korean speaking uh, interpreters? He, he, he asked how, uh, how did the Korean troops you commanded, how did they view you 
as a Japanese officer. Well, it was real strange because, uh, whoops, excuse me, I'm not used to that. Yeah. Well, it was when I first time landed in Korea, uh, then when I was, when I went, when I went to my first company, I was talking to General Kim, a Korean general. He and I would had a good conversation, and somebody came up to me and says, uh, "How come he keep calling you Hero?" So I said, "My name is Hiroshi." <laughs> and they said, that's what they call me hero. <laughs> and the general says, no, no, no. He says, we have only one hero in this war, and that's me. He says, your name is going to be, last name is Terukawa, you will be Sorry. named Terry. <laughs> and he changed my whole record, I think, in the military to Terry Terukawa. <laughs> yeah, it was, um, I was quite a good, funny general he was. You know, I, I had quite a bit of a deal with the Korean, Korean general one time. We went out to lunch. He came out, he took me out to lunch, the general. And we was in a restaurant in Korea, an off-limit area, which I'm not supposed to be there. <laughs> but the MP came in and looking for a United States soldier who was in the off-limit area. And they came up to me and looked at me, and, and strange, and I said, I talked to him, I said, Yongji, you know, I make a I said, I was an American soldier, but I was not, I mean, excuse, I'm a Japanese, and I was, what is this, how let's put this? For some or another, he didn't arrest me because I was talking to a Korean general and he looked at me real bad and he says, Terry is a guest of mine. So he told the MP to get lost. <laughs> <laughs> and so I had a nice lunch. <laughs> it was funny because he kept looking at me, the American uh, MP, and I keep saying, I keep speaking to him in Japanese. And he can tell the difference between Japanese and Korean, you know. <laughs> but uh, he was convinced that I was a Korean. <laughs> Terry, t tell them the story you told me when you first met the Japanese uh, tr uh, troops, and you told them that you're Japanese but you're American. Yeah. When I was first, um, I signed to a job of being a company commander about Korean soldiers. And they were, they were afraid of me because they found out that I was Japanese. And during the war, before the war, for the last 50 years, they, they were ruled by Japanese soldiers. So they were afraid that one of them would be the same way. But I told them I was American Japanese. From a, I was brought up in America. And I'm not going to be like the uh, typical Japanese soldier that was there before me. But it was a real, it's kind of funny, you know. It was, it was, they were so afraid of me. Every time they look at me, they salute me. <laughs> Don't salute me, I'm going to corporal, you know. <laughs> but uh, it's, it was funny. I had a company of Korean soldiers, and I had 250 Korean laborers working for me over there. And, and, one thing wrong with them was these Korean laborers every week every week they would come down to uh, they, they pick around five of those people and send them to frontline duty to carry ammunition for the soldiers. And I had to go up there and convince them that these people we needed just to battle the back line. Uh, that, I don't know what I'm talking about anymore. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I get carried away, you know? <laughs> oh, by the way, I said I have to say one thing. When I was overseas, I got a letter from my wife. She wrote every day. I had over 350 letters a year. And, you know, we were, we were married two weeks before I went overseas. <laughs> So she wrote to me every day, told me what she was doing, and I wrote back to her every day, told her what I was doing. And 
I had a stack of mail, but which I couldn't bring back because they won't let me do that. Oh, really? Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. But uh, <laughs> it felt good to get a letter every day, you know? Okay. If I didn't get one one day, next day I get two. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just like the Crusaders downstairs and the girls who wrote anonymously to the <coughs> soldiers overseas. That's the other part of the exhibit testers. Okay, David. Were they a lot of the letters censored back and forth during the war and after the war? Were your, were your letters censored uh, going back and forth to home? A little bit. Yeah. Yeah. No. yeah, the World War II guys say yes, uh, Terry says no. Terry says no? Yeah. He, doesn't rem he doesn't remember that. So. But my father, he wrote to his father in Japan. And uh, after the war, after World War II, and his letters were all open, you know. And all they said was, did you receive my care package from the United States to Japan? Because in Japan, the, they didn't have rice, they didn't have, you know, they, the food was bad or even grass, and stuff like that, you know, the terrible stuff. And my father was in San Jose, Japan, now sending care packages to, you know, Fukuoka, Japan. And, all his letters were open and they were resealed. And that was the civilian stuff. That was after the war. David said his father's letters uh, to his grandfather in Japan after the war, all the mail had been opened, he presumes, by uh, censors or somebody. Uh, I'd say one, one more question and then uh, we'll all go over to the VFW home. <coughs> I'm sorry if this excludes Terry a little bit, but um, regarding the Congressional Medal of Honor, uh, I don't know if any of you can express at the moment, or Tom, if you could express, were all of those that served World War II uh, able to go back to Congress to receive that, and what kind of uh, response having received that award means to you? Uh, maybe Tom could express it if you don't prefer to. Yeah, does anybody, does anybody want to talk about that? He's talking about the conversion of gold medal. Yeah. Buster, you... It was held here in Tanzania. As well. Yeah. He yeah. yeah. sponsored the... He uh, uh, got the medal to go, first of all. Who, who didn't go to Washington? Yeah. Yeah. I forgot the question. <laughs> 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 uh, he, he, he asked uh, about the Congressional Gold Medal. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what, what, it, what, 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 the, what it was like and uh, what did it mean to you? Um, my wife and I went, and also our four children went. And therefore, it was a very special occasion for us. We really enjoyed it. And how did they treat us? They treated us uh, real nicely. Um, for instance, uh, there was a convoy of buses from the hotel to the mall. And uh, we were about the second bus of a convoy of maybe five, and plus more later on. But when we left the hotel, we went straight to the mall without stopping. We had a police escort. <laughs> and uh, one more thing that made that special was that I talked with a uh, fellow over here, and he moved back to Pennsylvania, and uh, he heard about it. So from Pennsylvania, he came to the hotel to be with us. So I thought that was pretty special. Yeah. I'll tell you. I'll tell you my story. As, as you know, I went with uh, John Sakamoto. He was my first uh, roommate since college. <laughs> and, um, anybody's looking for accommodations, he's a great roommate. <laughs> um, but. Um, I guess because, first of all, about 300 some uh, veterans went. Just not very many, there's still a lot of Nisei veterans around, 
many is are it's difficult for them to travel or they're taking care of their wife and they can't travel um, something like 350 say and there was room for them and their escorts their family in this main area in the Capitol building and for those of us um, kind of extras there was a, a very nice theater adjacent to the big uh, Capitol room and that's where I watched the ceremony on the big TV and it was you know pretty much like being there so there weren't a lot of us in this big theater so there was you know two or three seats between people and there was a young Japanese American guy I'd say maybe in his 40s that's young for me um, sitting in a business suit uh, with his uh, Blackberry and the whole time these preliminary you know things were going on he was there very busy with his phone like this not paying any attention to anything everybody else in the theater is rapt attention to the screen so then things kind of get going and um, uh, John Boehner said a few words um, the other dignitaries said a few words and, and there were quite a few of them everybody seemed to want to be up there um, and I hear this guy kind of you know like clearing his throat a little bit and then he was kind of sniffling a little bit and five minutes later this guy was just crying crying and I realized he had never heard this story before he was there because his dad was there his dad needed an escort so he's, you know he's interrupting his business day and I don't know where they came from but this guy went from his Blackberry and no interest in the TV screen to just you know like the rest of us all interest to the TV screen but this was all new to him his father didn't talk about it I don't know what he thought he was going to the Capitol building for but uh, it made a tremendous impression on me that um, even the next generation, the Nisei's next generation, um, he was supportive. He was there for his father, but um, he didn't. He didn't get it. And then he's hearing these stories about the lost battalion, you know, and the stories about uh, the Gothic line in Italy and the stories about the accomplishments and the casualties um, and, and what these men and, and women went through as I said not just in the military but in their whole lives you know this guy had never heard that before so I, I know the Nisei are humble don't be too humble you know let your kids know let your grandkids know your little piece of history uh, it's it's very important so that's that's my public service announcement I'm going to give Joe back the microphone I'm going to go get my special book please don't be shy if you haven't signed my book for me please come up and sign it okay so here's Joe Yeah. <laughs>